Uhuru. Thank you, comrade brother Agwambo. I would like to express my deepest appreciation, first of all, uh, to the Botella Community Center for allowing us to have this event here on today. And uh, I would also like to thank all of you uh, for the, your generosity and hospitality since we have been here. As um, Guambo mentioned, I have come here immediately from the United States. Uh, Cherno has come here uh, from Sierra Leone. Uh, there are some others who are with us who have come uh, immediately from London, uh, initially from Congo. Uh, but because of conditions imposed on our people in Congo have been in exile uh, in London and various other places uh, in Europe. Uh, and your hospitality uh, has been splendid. It has been traditional African hospitality, and I want to express my appreciation uh, to you for that hospitality. Um, I have had an opportunity to work uh, briefly, uh, to meet briefly uh, with members of the East Africa uh, Committee that's been responsible for holding this event, and I would like to offer special thanks to them, uh, to Guambo, uh, to Chalo, uh, to Sister uh, Hakima, uh, to Wangui uh, in particular. These are people who I've had an opportunity to work with and uh, or to meet with since I've been here. Um, Africa, I think it's important to establish just a couple of things. One is uh, the fact that many people have uh, these ideas about the conditions of existence for African people in the United States that are generally wrong. Uh, the ideas that most people have, Africans included around the world, about uh, the conditions of existence for Africans in the United States are ideas that we've got from watching, watching Oprah, Win Oprah Winfrey on television or Will Smith or well, now that there's a situation where the U.S. in a state of desperation to solve some of the problems of imperialism has selected and then elected uh, an African as president. But I want to tell you that Oprah Winfrey and Will Smith and Barack Obama do not represent the conditions of existence of your brothers and your sisters who are suffering in the United States of America. I want to tell you that despite all of the misinformation that you get about how change has come to America, the reality is different. The reality is in the United States, one out of eight African men in their 20s is in prison today. 45% of the African population in the United States is either in prison or tied to the prison system in some way or another. The lifespan of Africans as compared to white people in the United States is deplorable. Our children die at childbirth two times the rate that white children die. So this notion that somehow Africans in the United States have this wonderful situation is a lie. And it is a lie that made it necessary for, for a Barack Obama to exist. Why is a Barack Obama necessary? Because, brothers and sisters, we live in a world where all the wealth that exists in Europe and North America, where an entire political economy has been created through the theft of the resources of Africa and other peoples around the world. Listen, I travel to Africa often, because this is home. And I go to Ghana, I see the same situations I see here. I see that our roads do not work. I see our women and our children who work like beasts of burdens. I see there is too little water and too often no unclean water. It's not just uh, something that's happening in Kenya. 
It's happening in what they call South Africa. It's happening in Ghana. It's happening in Sierra Leone, where some of the richest diamonds in the world come from on the one hand. But an African who brings the diamonds out of the earth will only receive 31 cents and a cup of rice a day for doing it, and is lucky if he gets that. This is the reality that we are confronted with as a people, but that is not an indication of who we are or what we are capable of. When we step outside and look at our situation, whether it's in Nairobi, or whether it's in Freetown, or whether it's in Harlem, in New York, the conditions of existence that we see ourselves confronted with are not conditions that are there because of some inferiority capacity of our own. When I walk the streets of Rotterdam and Amsterdam in Holland, as I have done, and see the magnificent architecture and edifices there, when I walk the streets in London and Manchester and Liverpool in England or in Paris and France or, or in New York, Manhattan, in, in, in Florida, in the United States, and I see the magnificent streets and I see that you can go to a tap anytime and turn on water and get water, clean water that you don't have to worry about, then I see what Africa is capable of because Amsterdam and because London and, 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 and Paris did not generate the resources to make that happen. Those are resources, those streets are paved in Amsterdam, in Rotterdam, in London, and in New York City as a consequence of what has been stolen from Africa. Yeah. That is why they are paved. What has been stolen from our Africa? And it is our contention that if we could pave the streets of Amsterdam and Rotterdam, if we can bring clean water to New York City in America, we can do the same thing in Freetown or Nairobi here in Africa. It is important for us to understand this because we've been sold a bill of goods. We've been taught about our inferiority. We've been taught that the reason we have nothing in Africa is because we are inferior. But yet, what we find is that there are ships and lorries leaving ports and highways in Africa every day taking away our resources to Europe and to North America. Listen, why is it that people in Kenya are hungry? On the one hand, but in Kenya, we're producing flowers that are sold on the streets of Philadelphia in the United States of America. It is because we are tied into a parasitic world economy, one that was created through the enslavement of African people. There are millions of African people just like you who no longer know their last names, who no longer know their first names because we have been kidnapped and spread around the world. There are 140 some odd million Spanish speaking Africans throughout Latin America. There are millions of Africans in the Caribbean. And we don't even know how many millions of Africans there are in North America because they're scared to tell us. Right? And many of us are confused about our identity just as we are confused about our identity here in Africa itself. You know we are confused about our identity, don't you? Because you know that all these borders that exist in Africa today, that they call countries, and that where they say these nations exist were created by Europeans. Did you know that? That Europeans got together in 1884 and 85, not even in Africa, but in Berlin, Germany and carved up Africa and gave portions of Africa to different European powers. That's how England became an influence and power in Kenya. That's how, that's how England became such a power in what we refer to as Nigeria. That's how it became a power in what we refer to as Ghana. Did you know 
that there's a place in West Africa called Cameroon. You're familiar with Cameroon, aren't you? Did you know that the reason it's called Cameroon is because when the Portuguese first got there, they found a lot of shrimp there. And Cameroon comes from the Portuguese word for shrimp. So you have a lot of Africans who are running around calling themselves shrimp. But they are not shrimp. I am not an African American. I am African. I am clear about my identity and I refuse to accept the identity imposed on me by the imperialists. I have not always been clear about my identity because my education, my education and definition of myself came from my oppressor. My oppressor told me that Africa was a place to be despised and hated. My oppressor who came to Africa and kidnapped me before I was even born, gave me his name, gave my father his name so that I could not trace my ancestry back here to Africa. That's who taught me who I was. And the same oppressor that was teaching me in the United States of America was teaching us through missionary schools right here on the continent of Africa and sometimes not just missionary schools. I don't know about here in Kenya, but I know uh, in places like Ghana that uh, the whole educational process is run out of England. I think it's Cambridge University. Isn't that where it is? Cambridge University out of England. You go to, you go to university in Ghana, you take a test. The test is sent to Cambridge University in England to determine how you did. Somebody else is in control of our brains. And so this is a structure, a struggle to recapture our brains so that we can recapture our identity. Because without access to our identity, we are weak in the face of a very formidable enemy who continues to steal everything we got. So we live in a world where I can sit up and watch my brothers and sisters who are killed in a place that they call Kenya I said, that's got nothing to do with me, because that's a Kenyan, and I'm an American, or American Negro, or whatever they decide I am this month, right? <laughs> and that thing, it happens to us everywhere in the world. How many times have you seen the same thing on television? You say, ah, oh, that's them, that's them Sierra Leoneans. But the reality is those are Africans because before Europeans came to Africa, there were no borders in Africa that separated one of us from the other one of us. And if we accept these borders, we remain weak because the French doesn't care what we call ourselves. The French come here, they exploit us, the British exploit us, the Germans exploit us, the Spanish exploit us, or the US exploit us. So all of them have no problems getting together to take what we got, but we can't get together to take what belongs to us. Something is wrong with that. We have to fix that. That's what it's about. That's what this meeting is about. It is a call to awareness. It is a statement also to say that we don't have to be beggars because everything has been taken from us. Europe could not function 30 days if it were not getting the resources it gets from Africa. America could not function for 30 days if it were not for the resources they steal from Africa. And they are aware of this. This is why it was necessary for them to destroy this man. You're familiar with Marcus Garvey. He's an African man who in the early part of the 20th century uh, uh, kidnapped, he, he, he grew up in Jamaica, an island where they had taken Africans in the Caribbean. And he, he, as I have had to do, looked around the world and saw everywhere he looked, Africans were poor, oppressed, and exploited. And he left Jamaica, and he came to New York City in America. And he built an incredible organization called the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League that had 11 million members and supporters throughout the African world. Not only in Africa, but in places like India and Australia, where there are other black people like you and I, 
who are catching hell on a daily basis. It was an incredible organization. Its slogan was Africa for Africans, those at home and those abroad. That was the slogan of Garvey. One Africa, one nation. One Africa, one nation. And it was something that terrified the imperialists. You look at the Kenyan flag, you see the red, black, and green there? It is from Garvey in 1920. The convention, Universal, the, the Negro Improvement Association of the World had an international convention in, Ma in New York City. 25,000 African people from around the world who declared Garvey the provisional president of Africa. Not of one little place in Africa that the white people said was ours, but all of Africa. And they decided that our flag, as a people, we needed our own flag. And they said that one flag should fly from the hilltops of Africa. One flag. And that flag would be red, black, and green. Red for the blood that has been shed over the centuries by our people and our struggles. Black for us, black people. And green for our Africa. And this became the flag of African people. It has influenced some of the flags that you see in various places in the African world today. It was Garvey who influenced Kwame Nkrumah. Said one of the most important things he ever read was the book by Marcus Garvey. That influenced him, and as you know, Nkrumah was the person who they also hated and feared because he understood the power of a united African and African people. And in 1966, after having led the struggle to free Ghana in 1966, he was overthrown by the United States government. That is why they hated and feared Patrice Lumumba from Congo. You've heard of Patrice Lumumba, who was an incredible leader, who stood up to the Belgians and stood up to the United States and stood up to the French and said the wealth and resources of the Congo should belong to the people of Congo. But even before most of this happened, an incredible movement was happening in this land base. And I want, I'm, I'm calling it Kenya, but it is Africa, where Dedan Kimati and the Kenyan Land Freedom Army stood up against the mighty British Army. You know, that wasn't a small thing. Because the British, up until the Second Imperialist War, England controlled 45% of the world. 45%, I'm sorry, at least a quarter of the world's population and a quarter of the world's territory. You know what England is? It's a little rock, cold and barren without resources, which is part of what contributed to it becoming a thief because it had nothing of its own. And so up until 1945 or so, England controlled something like 25% of the surface of the planet Earth and 25% of the Earth's population. And the Kenyan Land Freedom Army stood up against the British Empire right here. And it was something that gave pride uh, uh, to and, and built the morale of African people around the world. How is it that you think that in North America today we create, we come up with a slogan, Uhuru? We say Uhuru to you in Kenya because you said Uhuru first to us in North America. It's one struggle. It's one struggle. Otherwise, we couldn't have been excited about what the Kenyan Land Freedom Army was doing. It's one struggle. That's why in Paris, France, when they murdered Patrice Lumumba, the African students rebelled in the streets of France. It's one struggle. Didn't say we can't do anything because he's from the Congo. But what they call a Congo now is something that was defined by the imperialists themselves. So we say we have to come out of this situation. So we have a situation where peoples around the world are trying to change this relationship they have with the empire. Someone asked, do you know what imperialism is? Imperialism is a word that comes from the word empire. Empire is a situation where one country lives 
off, the, at the, uh, 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 off of other peoples around the world. They live off the expense of somebody else, not because of what they produce, but because of what they can take from other folk. So they call these empires. You heard of the Roman Empire, the British Empire. Uh, that's what empires are. And so this concept of imperialism is this tendency toward empires. Well, we don't want no empire. We just want our Africa back for ourselves. We just want our Africa back for ourselves. We want a situation where the resources of Africa and African people can go to feed our children. We don't give a damn if Margaret Thatcher or Queen Elizabeth ever see another chilling in their lives again if it has to come at the expense of Africa and African people. Yes. We want our resources for our people. Yes. We feel like we have a responsibility to so that our children can see a future. What kind of people is it that will not do whatever is necessary to guarantee a future for its children? If your children have no future, you have no destiny. It's over for you. And so that's what this is about. So what is happening is you look around the world, you say a system in crisis, because it's an international system. It's not a Kenyan system. It's not a British, it's an international system. That's why, that's why you see uh, the troops in a place called Iraq. Why would they be killing people in Iraq? Because it's a parasitic world economy. They need the oil from Iraq to keep their factories running. They need the oil from Iraq to keep their automobiles running. They don't care about what happens to the Iraqi people, but the Iraqi people care. And so they are fighting back to take their resources. That's what's happening in occupied Palestine, where the Palestinian people are trying to take back their resources. That's what's happening in Venezuela under the leadership of Hugo Chavez, uh, where the Venezuelans have stood up to America to take back their resources. That's what happened in Cuba. That's what's happening in Ecuador. That's what happened all around the world. People are struggling to take back their resources. And as they struggle to take back their resources, what is happening is economic crisis is all over the Western world. You want to know why there's crisis? Because it's a parasite. Are you familiar with tapeworms in a place like Kenya? You know what a tapeworm is, don't you? Uh, and in and, and North America, it used to be a pretty big problem, uh, especially people eating all that old rotten meat, you know, because uh, in that meat sometimes there hides this larva and uh, 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 that will turn into a worm. And you eat that meat and the larva attaches itself to your intestine. Yes. Doesn't do any work at all. You go out and work if you're lucky enough to have a job. You work and work and work. You buy food, you eat food. No matter how much you eat, you can't get any bigger. But the tapeworm doesn't do any work at all, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger of what you do. And uh, that's how this whole system is. It's like a tapeworm. It's a parasite. It doesn't live off what it produces. It lives off what you produce. That's why you can't talk this tapeworm into being nice. You can't talk this system into changing its attitude. What will happen if the tapeworm ever freed your intestines? It would die. So you look at a social system that requires the servitude, the enslavement of African people for its continuing existence. Nevertheless, Africans have to be free. And so what you see around the world is people fighting for their freedom. Everybody is hating U.S. imperialism. They thought it was George W. Bush they hated. They say, we hate this Bush man, right? But Bush was not an individual. Bush was the head of the United States government. He was the head of the imperialist country. And it came to a situation where he was so hated. And he, because he created so much resistance of oppressed peoples around the world, Bush himself became a problem. And they had to have somebody else there who could stem the tide of resistance that was happening by dark people all around the world. And so they identified somebody who could stand in for imperialism. And Krumah called it neo-colonialism. When the white man cannot stand up to you in his own skin, in his own face, it's called indirect rule. It is white power in a black face. And that is exactly what Barack Obama is today. They need him. They have begun to understand that they will not be able to subdue 
the masses of people around the world at gunpoint as George Bush attempted to do. So if they cannot subdue the people at gunpoint, they have decided to seduce the people into slavery. And so Barack Obama is the one who is supposed to seduce us into a stance of inactivity uh, to keep us from resisting against our conditions of existence. We say we really need change we can believe in. And that is not Barack Obama, you see. So what is it that we need? We need each other. Because we are powerless without each other. Our weakness is based on the fact that they have separated us from each other and they have separated us from our assets here, our resources here in Africa and elsewhere. In order for us to strengthen ourselves, we have to come together. If we come together, you look at a place like China. China, more than a billion people, uh, but China hasn't half the resources that Africa has. But China is the fastest growing economy in the world. China is the fastest growing economic force in Africa today. Why? Because when Europe deals with China, it deals with one China. When England deals with China, it deals with one China. When France deals with China, it deals with one China. Well, when the United States deals with China, it deals with one China. But when they deal with Africa, they deal with 54 different Africans. And because they can deal with 54 different so-called Africans, they misuse us. They play us one against the other. They, 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 it does not allow us to work at full strength. There are one and a half billion Africans in the world. And yet we are proud because we're supposed to be a nation in a place like Equatorial Guinea of one million people. What kind of nation is that? Did you know that in what they call Sub-Saharan Africa, that 35 of the 45 uh, so-called African uh, countries have 10 million or less people in them because that's how the colonizers des designed it? We say the borders that separate us have to go. Both the borders in Africa and the borders in our brains that keep us from being able to recognize each other as one African people. So this is a movement that we are determined to build. We need leadership. I heard Comrade Cherno talk about the question of leadership. That's what we are about. Create organization everywhere in the African world. We're talking about everywhere. So that if you are hurt in Kenya, I will feel your pain in the United States and respond to it. And if I am hurt in France, in Sierra Leone, they will feel my pain and respond to it. We take up the slogan, if you touch one, you touch all. Touch one, touch all. That is where our strength is. That we take our resources and pull them together. That we have no interest as a people in these borders. These borders are designed simply to extract value from Africa. That's what they were created for, to take our stuff. So we build organization. We create leadership throughout the African world that can respond to the needs of African people. We stop begging. We come together ourselves. If we need something, we find a way to get it. We raise our own money. We have fundraisers. We sell dinners. We do what's necessary because if you beg, whoever gives you the money pays to tell you what to do. If you, if you want to be free, then you have to strike out and act like an independent people. If we want something, let us get together out here. Let's raise some money collectively to do what it is that we want to do because if you're on somebody else's payroll, they will control you. And guess what? You might have something here in Kenya that you don't think is worth that much, that's that important. But if you can get it to me in North America, it's possible that I can do something with it that can get some resources for both of us. I might have something in the United States that you don't have here. I'm, whether I can use it or not, but if I can get it to you, we can turn it into something that can help both of us. The same thing is true throughout the African world. This is the kind of relationship that we have to build. We, have to, we can train each other. We can bring expertise to each other. And if we do, we don't have to.
to have Europeans in our lives telling us what to do and how to do it. We don't have to be beggars. They have stolen every damn thing we've got. What, how do we look? Going to the thief who's stolen what we've got, continuously begging the thief to give us a part of what they've stolen from us. It seems to me it's about time for us to stop the thievery and take what belongs to us as a people. So that's what this effort is about. And I want to thank you again for this welcome. You know, there are a lot of brothers and sisters, your brothers and sisters, who are in the United States and other places in the world who will never see home. Did you know that? They will, they will never see home. And I know it's something that you take for granted. And when I'm riding with brothers and sisters, whether it's in occupied Zania that they call South Africa or Ghana or Namibia, and I'm commenting on Africa, oh, Africa, <laughs> the beauty of Africa, the vastness of Africa. And they look at me as some strange kind of person. And I say, you just don't understand. You just take it for granted. You're here with it all the time, you know? Uh, but for those of us who've been separated from Mother Africa, to have an opportunity to come here and be with you, with our brothers and sisters whom I haven't seen in such a long time, it is just magnificent. And the interesting thing, and I'm gonna say this in God of your way, is that what we continue to learn on every trip is that this notion about the difference that exists between us is a myth. It's a myth here in Kenya too. Yes. It's a myth, the difference between Kikuyu, Kikuyu and Lua and all this nonsense, it's, bull, it's nonsense. <laughs> that's, 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 that serves our oppressors. It doesn't do a damn thing for us. It serves our oppressors because what strikes me, what strikes me is I walk down the streets, whether I'm in Harlem, uh, New York, uh, in Accra, and I see Africans, they look just like somebody I know uh, with the last place I was. I, I walk here in Kenya, I see Africans look just like people I know uh, in New York City or in Georgia, in the United States of America. We one damn people and we better start acting like it. Our oppressor know that we are one people. It's time for us to understand that and take back what belongs to us. Thank you so much, I'm Africa. Uhuru. E Africa. One Africa. One nation. One nation.